Before history is written, it's played. Before it's frozen in time, it's fought one shift at a time. Before it's etched in silver, it's carved in ice. What happens next will last forever. The Stanley Cup Final on ABC and ESPN Plus begins Saturday. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Many of us have those stubborn pounds that seem impossible to lose, no matter how good we eat or how hard we work out. My solution is Plush Care. Plush Care is a leading telehealth provider with doctors who are there for you day and night to partner with you in your weight loss journey. They can prescribe FDA-approved weight loss medications like Wagovi and Zepbound for those who qualify. Plus, they accept most insurance plans. To get started, visit plushcare.com slash weight loss. That's plushcare.com slash weight loss. Hello and welcome to the Paddock and the Pavilion with me, your host, Stephen Wallace. The 2024 Men's T20 World Cup is now underway. And on today's show, I am taking you back to 2010, when England won the competition in the Caribbean. Joining us for the latest episode in our What Was It Like To series is the former England all-rounder Mike Yardy, who played in all seven of England's matches at the tournament. Let's hear Mike's story of a famous two weeks for English cricket. What was it like to win the T20 World Cup? Oh, it was obviously kind of very special in terms of, um, you know, a kind of global tournament and, um, yeah, it's kind of a team. It wasn't like, I suppose teams now are kind of built over a period of time, but this team was kind of brought together. Um, I've been kind of record after a couple of years there's a few others who had come in a few people kind of playing starting in I think Keys Vetter and Lum so it was kind of uh, kind of early stages of a team and it all kind of clicked very quickly and um, yeah it went really well in terms of that and it was a yeah probably arguably the most special kind of three weeks of definitely my cricket career um, in terms of you know being involved A playing for England and B kind of being being involved in a successful team I think yeah that's kind of yeah, for a three-week period, it was very special. Well, thanks for that, Mike. I'd like to now sort of go into a bit deeper into the story of uh, your World Cup winner and T20 cricket week, really, because that only began in England in 2003. What did you think to the format when it when it started? Well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because, I mean, I was a young player at Sussex at the time, and it, it, although it was a new concept for the professional game, I'd grown up playing club and junior cricket 20 over league cricket every kind of most evenings a week um so <laughs> it's new obviously very new to the professional game but I think a lot of players you know especially coming through had played a lot of kind of 20 over cricket and that had been you know where we kind of start playing so um I think it was initially it was I think it was, it was I think it was a few skeptics early on but I think one thing from what I can remember in 2003 was the crowds were huge in terms of what a, been to county games before kind of people really embraced it and I think clubs did it really well in terms of adding you know swimming pools and jacuzzis on the side of pitches and things like that and kind of adding to the spectacle and yeah I think it was a I think it was a great summer in terms of weather wise but it was it was great so and it quickly kind of kind of grew and I think initially players you know kind of didn't really know what to expect and then I think for the next few years everyone wanted to kind of play you know 2020 cricket and and like we're, we're here, we are now in 2024, and you know it's grown to what it is now. So it's um, yeah, it's it's fantastic that you know from where it started to now is is yeah, I think it's awesome for cricket in terms of the uh, um, what's the phrase kind of the way it's seen all over the world now. I think it's and you know and it, you know the whole concept of bringing 2020 cricket in was to you know introduce new audiences, and it's certainly done that and. Um, you know, like the hundred has now. So I think it's it's I think it's great, and it will keep the game growing for for long periods of time. 
Well, you first played T20 cricket, cricket for Sussex in 2004, mm. but in 2004 and 2005, you did very little bowling. It was only 2006 when you started to, to bowl more because you were a frontline batsman at Sussex. Yeah, so I used, I used to bowl little seamers, not very good. Um, and then I I remember playing a game, I think it was in the second team, and I got hit for 34 and over, and that kind of that finished my seam bowling off and... I then kind of that that the next winter worked really hard between I think it was two thousand five winter worked really hard and kind of developing as a spinner and um, yeah and that then allowed me to bowl I think because like we found in T Twenty cricket initially people thought spinners spinners would get whacked and it never happened and I you know started bowling spin and became I suppose effective in T Twenty cricket early on and that that helped me as uh, yeah initially at Sussex because it you know it wasn't just an out and out batter or someone. You know, ended up becoming an all rounder, and then you're a lot more, um, you know, helpful and effective to the team. And then my kind of cricket went from there. And I kind of look at the change I made as a kind of catalyst for my career, really, in terms of going from seam to spin, in terms of particularly, you know, getting England opportunities. And, and you know, and that's so it was a, it was an absolute godsend that I got hit for 34 and that over. Otherwise, I could have been just keep rolling out the seamers. Well, England came calling quite quickly. You played. For England on the 28th of August 2006 against Pakistan at Bristol. Yes, the debut, yeah, I remember it well. Um, yeah, kind of, it was a game, I think it ha- all happened quite quickly because I was injured that summer. I've been on a, what, what would be a Lions tour now, an A tour in the winter, and hadn't done particularly well, um, but started the season well. And then when they, I think they, there was a Sri Lanka series and when they were picking that, I was injured. So I thought I might have had a sniff and then kind of continued the good form and then, yeah, played in that that game. And I think it was a, there was a one-off T20 and then five one days against Pakistan and, you know, made my T20 and ODI debut um, that series. And, yeah, and re- like like anything, it was an um, unbelievable experience, a bit surreal to make your England debut, but something that I definitely enjoyed. And, yeah, I was a little back fondly with good memories. Well, your debut, you've scored... 24 in 14 balls back in number seven and got Muhammad Yusuf out. So it's a good start. Yeah, that will do. That will do. It's like, yeah, it's, um, I think we would, we didn't have a huge score and then I kind of got a few away at the end. So it was quite nice. And I remember him miss hitting one for six over my head and, um, you know, because it was a tiny boundary and then playing a similar shot and it just didn't quite get there. Ian Bell caught it on the rope. So I was very grateful for that. And, um, yeah, he's it. Yeah, to get a player like that, however you get them, even if it is on the rope, is uh, yeah, special. Because you were part of a very successful Sussex side at that that point, and domestically in the T20, mm. you got to the semi-finals in 2007 and won the trophy in 2009 when you were captain. Yeah, it was my first year as captain. Um, again, again, I, I think I think I, I loved four day cricket, and I really kind of embraced the kind of all the challenges that come with it. But there was there is something, I think, my favourite format as a player was definitely T20 cricket and having the opportunity to captain and kind of work with the coach, Mark Robertson, and kind of mould a team because I think we we did well in 2007 and then I think we finished bottom in 2008 and we lost quite a few players, um, senior players at that point and it was a nice opportunity to kind of build a team around more youngsters and, and had yeah had the initial success of winning it and... But we still had some, you know, quality older players in terms of, you know, Murray Goodwin, um, James Kirtley, um, you, uh, Yasser Arafat, although he wasn't that old, but he was very experienced. And then, you know, Luke Wright was in the team as well. And he was still a young player, but he played for England and, you know, was very successful. Um, and kind of, yeah, we built, built a kind of a, a really strong team that were kind of really effective, particularly at home in our own conditions. We kind of had a lot of spinners in myself. Um, Rory Hamilton Brown, Chris Nash. Um, I'm missing a spinner now. Um, Will Beer. Was she still so, playing then? Or no, she... Mushy retired at that point. So, yeah, that was obviously a big hole. But we kind of had, you know, myself and, and three relatively young spinners um, in the middle overs, you know, James Kirtley and Yasser Arafat. Um, Luke Wright was bowling them. So we kind of, we had a, a very effective and a, t- and, a, a, and a team and style that really, as I say, worked really well at home from those types of pitches and, and we adapted really well away from ha- from home as well. So that was really, really special in terms of being part of building a team and then obviously going on to win a T20 and 
you know, the special day that is finals day at, at Edgbaston. That must have been a lot to do, though, when you're captain and, and being an all-rounder. Yeah, it's great because you're always in the game, aren't you? So, um, no, I, I, I particularly, I, I, like I said, I, I really enjoyed my four years as captain of Sussex. Um, but I particularly enjoyed captaining T20 just because of people, I suppose people can say oh, it's easy captain T20, but I don't think it is. I think because you, you have to make quick decisions and kind of you have a general plan, but if things don't go to play, you make quick decisions and kind of understand who's suited to, to kind of bowl and at who and, you know, what changes in the batting order. So that's, that's quite kind of exciting. And I enjoyed that part of it in terms of T20 cricket. And, um, and we had, I mean, we won it that year, but I think, you know, we got to a finals day and always got to kind of quarter finals during that period. We were kind of, we had a very good team who, you know, who, you know, always, always in the back end of tournaments, which, yeah, which is really nice for the club. Was that the season that got you back in the England reckoning? Cause you then, picked in the provisional squad for the 2010 World Cup which we're now going to go on to yeah I think so I think I did, I did a really good year that year domestically and then I don't know if you remember there was the Champions League um, where the top two teams got picked and I had a good couple of games in in that um, in that tournament as well um, so I think that kind of really helped it obviously played a little bit before but I always yeah I always felt playing for England that T20 was definitely my my best format um, and yeah, more than probably fifty over cricket. I kind of my bowling was a little bit uh, limited for fifty over cricket in terms of wicket taking options. But I was, you know, I always felt that I was effective in T Twenty cricket. So, um, so I was all yeah, always comfortable kind of bowling in that. I think that mentality of being comfortable to bowl a dot or, or go for one. It was something I was quite effective at. But actually trying to get wickets, I you know probably didn't have enough skill to kind of um, to do that. Which you know I think. Um, yeah, which I think you, you need in 50 over cricket. You need wicket takers in the middle where, yeah, I didn't, no, I don't necessarily think I had that, but definitely in T20 cricket when it came to kind of squeezing batsmen and making it really tricky to score, I think I was really effective. And squad wise, this uh, the original squad of 30, uh, there was a couple of shot changes following the England Lions playing a, a game against England with Keith Wetter and Michael Lum both coming into the team. Yeah, I, as I mentioned it earlier, I. I I wasn't involved in that, um, but yeah, I remember kind of that. I think they, I think oh, I can remember the England Lions beat England, and those two played particularly well, and then got called up and, and and played particularly well in the World Cup as well. So that must have been a brave call to to select them because I mean it would be a good question for anyone, but the two England batsmen that played the the T Twenty game before the World Cup were Joe Denley and Jonathan Trott. Right. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, I suppose uh, and they're mighty fine players themselves. I don't. Yeah, I suppose that's the thing as the selectors, you make calls and you know, and that's their job and to make decisions. And um, you know, it, well, it worked in terms of how well you know Lummy and, and Craig did. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's not always easy to make those calls, and I'm sure they're difficult decisions. But that one worked, certainly worked. You are listening to the Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. I hope you are enjoying our latest episode in our What Was It Like To series. Previous cricketing guests in this series have included Rick McCosker in What Was It Like To Play World Series Cricket, Jenny Thompson in What Was It Like To Play Against A World Eleven, and Dennis Amis in What Was It Like To Play A Boxing Day Ashes Test Match. You can find all of these episodes on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google, Spotify and YouTube. Now let's get back to Mike and World Cup T20 action, which for England in 2010 began on the 3rd of May. Moving on to the tournament then, the third T20 World Cup, uh, India had won the, the first one in 2007, Pakistan in 2009, and England, a bit of a chequered history, we'd failed to get out of the Super 8 series on both occasions. And in fact, uh, I must put this in because I've spoken to him on the podcast before, but we lost to Holland in uh, 2009 and I've had Paul Van Meekeren on this program before mm. so I thought I'd get that in for him but what were your hopes when you went to the World Cup in the Caribbean? Well I think like like any you go to a World Cup I think we, I think we quickly realised um, in the warm-up games that we beat Bangladesh comfortably and we beat South Africa and I think I remember speaking to Stuart Broad about it and um, and Luke Wright as well and we were talking about it and saying actually we, we seem to have a lot of kind of Bases covered in terms of 
you know, we're taking on the, we're able to kind of make advantage of the first six overs. We've got, you know, quality players in middle overs in, you know, guys like Morgan and Collingwood and, you know, Peterson. And then, and then I think we've got quite a, um, well, well, kind of structured bowling attack. So it was like there was a feeling that there was a lot of optimism going to those games. But actually, we could have easily not got out of the first group in terms of we had a couple of rain affected games. One against the West Indies, where um, I, well, it felt really harsh because I think the West Indies were chasing something like sixty off six overs after we had scored ninety seven in oh, sorry one hundred ninety seven in twenty. So I think we got we felt a little bit hard done by there, and they won off last few balls, and then. We played against Ireland and um, and scored a relatively low score on a really tricky pitch. Um, but again, weather kind of intervened, and actually, I think we were only overway from losing to Duckworth Lewis. I still, I'd still say that if we'd have got to play a twenty-over game there, we'd have won on that pitch. But who knows? Um, but yeah, so we kind of like got through. I suppose some people would say, you know, relatively, you know, with a little bit of luck. Um, but from that on point onwards, I think there was a real confidence in the group, and even what happened there didn't really kind of dampen any spirits. I think there was a a kind of relief because I think genuinely people thought we could do well in the tournament. You know, that was not not, not, not I don't think it was a case of like, oh we don't an embarrassment to go out early. I think it was a genuine feeling we could do well in the tournament, so that's why we wanted to get through. So yeah, uh, when you play the West Indies, uh, 191 for five in, in those days, that was a massive score, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so um, and I think particularly on that pitch, I think I think I felt like we had scored really well, and then the rain came, and it was yeah, I think it was a six over game, and um, yeah, we're a little bit hard done by, but that, you know that's history now. <laughs> your brain needs support, and new Ollie Brainy Chews are a delightful way to take care of your cognitive health. Made with scientifically backed ingredients like Thai ginger, L-theanine, and caffeine. Brainy Chews support healthy brain function and help you find your focus, stay chill, or get energized. Be kind to your mind and get these nootropic chews at ollie.com. That's O-L-L-Y dot com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. At Bed 365 we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Whether it's a walk-off, grand slam, or a base hit to center field. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. At Bet365, we don't do ordinary. We believe that every sport should be epic. Every home run, every hit, every inning, every play. From the moments that are legendary to the ones that fly under the radar. Whether it's a walk-off, grand slam, or a base hit to center field. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. 21 plus only must be physically located in Virginia. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. You then move on to the Super 8s, uh, playing against Pakistan, South Africa, and New Zealand. And you swept all before you in those games winning by six wickets 39 runs and three wickets yeah yeah I think at that point we were we were playing really really well I remember yeah I remember the the game against Pakistan we kind of restricted them really well and then KP played really well um batted first against South Africa again I mean, KP was like he was playing on a different level at that point um and, you know, it was actually a pleasure just to sit in the dugout and watch him and kind of yeah experience that um and 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 then yeah and then we played with yeah and then we played New Zealand and, and beat them in St Lucia so you know yeah I think that was it it was a team really I think clearing the plans bowling wise and then you know strong top order you know and then people with a skill and you know of, of Peterson and Morgan you know made such a difference in terms of um in terms of adding that quality and, and, and Paul Collinwood as captain was very calm and relaxed and and I think that that really showed, you know, in the team. Yeah, bowling wise yourself against Pakistan, you got two for nineteen and against South Africa, two for thirty one. And as you said, Kevin Peterson, majestic form seventy three against Pakistan and fifty three against South Africa. Yeah, amazing. He was um he, yeah, he was playing brilliantly. You could some of the shots he was playing were kind of like like he did all, all through his career to be fair but 
I think that I think he obviously was player of the tournament, but he was yeah he was he was playing at the peak of his powers at that point. Did everyone know their role in the team? Because it was a very settled side. You only played twelve players in the whole tournament. Yeah, no, I think that was that was it, isn't it? Is that that kind of thing? Is that when you talk about teams having success, it's really you know having continuity and real clear role clarity, and that was and that was really that was kind of spelt out by kind of Andy and and Collie, and everyone was really clear on what role they were fulfil. Um, and then you put in you know a level of confidence to that, and you know and some good skill level, you you you're likely to be you know in a bit of luck you're going to be successful so I think that's something that was really really clear in terms of what people's roles in spe- specific situations um and yeah and I think that really worked well did you know yourself the sort of overs you were going to bowl was it the middle overs or back end yeah I think we kind of we kind of got to a pattern where you know we bowled seam through the first six and then the swath self and Swanee would bowl for a period in the middle and then it might change slightly and might bring a bit of scene back and then we'll come at the end. So yeah, it was, it, it was, it was, yeah, it was really, it was really clear and, you know, just depending on certain game situations, it might change by an over or two. And, and um, yeah, that was, that was, yeah. And as I say, that was, I think part of the reasons, you know, people, our team was successful, but also all teams are successful. You know, when people are really clear on their roles, then I think it creates a kind of calmness in the group. You hear about it a lot now, but, were the was the much data analysis? Did you have a data analyst with you or things like that? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that I mean, we analyze the opposition, um, you know, not not uh, in great detail, but we could, you know, watch the opposition and, and understand kind of their strengths. And, um, but I think fundamentally, one thing that came across with the group was actually, yes, we know what the opposition can do, but what are our strengths as well? And I think that's something that. I hasn't really changed actually. I think now I think you you want to understand where the opposition have strengths and maybe kind of um, areas or weaknesses you can target. But fundamentally, it's if you're playing how you want to play to your strengths, then that's the best call rather than focusing too much on the opposition. And I don't think that's kind of changed now, but that certainly was the the main focus at the time. The games came quick and fast as well, didn't they? You, mm-hmm. you didn't have much time off. No, it was quite a short tournament. Um, Short tournament, but then also it wasn't, you know, T20 cricket is, yeah, three, four hours. So it wasn't, um, yeah, it was. And and they're they're also quite early in the morning, some of the games. I think we played against Pakistan. It started at nine o'clock or half nine just because of the times in the Caribbean. So, you know, you get the rest of the day to rest. I suppose if you're playing well, that probably actually helps if you're playing quickly. Yeah, it's an an interesting one, isn't it? Because you're kind of like, I think sometimes as long as you get the balance of you just want games to come because if you yeah if you're playing well you keep the confidence and if you're not playing well sometimes it's quite nice to keep having games you don't dwell on the past you can get move on so I think yeah as long as as long as it doesn't become too much in terms of fatigue and things like that then it, it, it I think it suits everyone really. Semi final uh, you beat Sri Lanka by seven wickets and um, they they scored 128 for seven and and you know you're talking about bowling to. Sangakara, Jai, Jai Wardner, Jai Saria, uh, Dilshan. Mm. Yeah, I think from what I can remember, again, I might be wrong. You can correct me. I'm sure we got some early wickets and that kind of, and then they had to rebuild their innings. I think Tim Bresnan got some early wickets and I think that then they had to rebuild their innings. And I think St. Lucia was a relatively big ground, so it's not easy to kind of like catch up um, in terms of, getting a big score and everyone kind of as I say everyone's clear on their roles and you know also within the field so it became yeah it was yeah it was um it was probably a little, well it was a bit under par so and then the final you're playing Australia I hadn't realized until I looked back how actually remarkable it was that Australia actually even reached the final in their semi-final against Pakistan they wanted 48 off 17 balls to win a game mm. with three wickets left yeah, Mike Hussey went berserk. I remember watching it. So because we, I think we would landed in in Barbados to the final, and then they were a day behind. So yeah, we watched that, and it was incredible. Yeah, so it was. Um, yeah, I suppose a remarkable innings by a remarkable player. So yeah, and they they would have come in. No, they did come in a huge amount of confidence from that because, like you say, is that particularly back in you know fifty fourteen years ago, that was yeah you know, that was very unlikely not like it is now or now it's not such a surprise but then that that very rarely happened if it if it ever happened um so yeah so they kind of got through and um 
Yeah, he played an unbelievable innings. I remember him, I think, hitting a couple of sixes off Sai Ajmal again, who's someone who's very tricky at the death. So, yeah, it was a remarkable innings and, you know, it meant that England played Australia in the final. Now, did it seem different lining up with the national anthem in, in a final? A real special occasion for you? Yeah, I think, I think yeah, it, yeah, a final like that, it, it is slightly different. Um, in it, yeah, again, it's. I think the one thing I always felt playing for England, you always felt like a, you know, nerves because it is you represent your country. There's more kind of expectation on it from yourself and and it wanting to do well. So, yeah, and it's it's a World Cup final, so it's um it is extra special. And we made a fantastic start, England. Uh, Australia were eight for three after two point one overs. Yeah, it was a bit kind of remark. It was absolutely remarkable. I remember. I think there was a one down the leg side and Nick that. There's a run out early on. Yeah. So, yeah, it was kind of all worked out perfectly. And they kind of, yeah, they were, they kind of then built a partnership. And I remember it felt like they targeted me and got me for a one big over. Um, but apart from that, they didn't really, they didn't really get going. I think only, I think off the top of my head, 140 odd. 147 for six they got. Yeah. yeah. 147 for six. So they kind of, apart from that kind of big over for me, they didn't really get going in their innings, which I think at Barbados, that was about 15, 20 under par. From what I can remember, <laughs> and despite you losing Michael Lum quite early, um, England with Keith Wetter and uh, uh, Kevin Peterson again, you won relatively easily with uh, I think three overs to spare. It, it's an it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think it, 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 he looked back now and you think three overs to spare, but I remember sitting in the dugout; it felt like it was a million miles off, even when you needed. I think at some point we needed something like you know less than a run of ball, but it felt so such a long way away when you're sitting there watching and kind of getting ready to bat. It didn't feel, yeah, it, it felt such a, but I mean, to be fair to, well, Collie and, and, and Morgs, they kind of did it very easily, made it look very easy and kind of got us home. So that was, um, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was unbelievable. And it kind of, it was, I think it was the way kind of the tournament went really. We didn't really have, it, well, apart from, well, in the super, super sixes, we didn't really have, any tight games we won you know comfortably relatively comfortably all the way through so um you know which you know is unheard of really winning a tournament usually there's a couple of games that kind of get a bit tight but yeah it didn't seem you know it just seemed like every game was you know we won relatively you know you know with a with a bit you know a bit of space at the end no side really got a big score against england no no i think it kind of as i say it was a bowling attack that and the seamers had you know, I think it was the first real time anyone's seen the kind of slide ball bounces and all the, you know, uh, side bottom Bresnan and Broad had kind of nailed them brilliantly and, you know, very difficult to get at the end. So no one, so once, you know, we'd done the job early, it felt like yeah, they couldn't really catch up because they had, you know, good skills at the end to kind of squeeze teams out. So it felt very difficult if you got behind the game to kind of, you know, to really cash in at the end. This was an England squad that had Jimmy Anderson on the sidelines for the whole tournament. Yeah, incredible, incredible. So, um, yeah, I think it was a, it was a, yeah, very good squad and kind of, yeah, it was a, again, I think, I think they, they felt that, you know, they felt that the importance of a left arm seamer in kind of Ryan's side bottom and then probably felt that you know, needed two spinners as well. So that kind of, that's how they kind of put the team together. And then I suppose, you know, Broad and, and Bresnan, you know, both, very good batters, so it gave depth to the batting lineup as well. England's first ever World Cup win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah, it's yeah, it's very, very kind of like yeah, very kind of special and something. I like definitely even now I look fondly on because yeah, you know, I, I like I, I say to people, I only played fourteen T twenties for England, and you know, seven of them were in a you know in a World Cup winning squad, so. You know, I feel very fortunate to kind of play at the time I did with the players I did in that in that period of time because you know you can play a hundred games, but if circumstances aren't you know it doesn't don't align, then it doesn't happen. So I feel kind of yeah, very lucky to have been picked and and you know happy that you know contributed like I did. So it's a uh, yeah uh, you know very like I said at the start, a very special kind of three weeks in my cricketing life. You carried on to play for England in two thousand and ten, and then went to the. 50 over World Cup in 2011, but yeah, sadly had to return home for uh mental health reasons. Um, how were you feeling during the 2010 World Cup? Were, were you feeling okay? 
Yeah, and, and yeah, I think so. I think I'd had like quite a yeah, the, the kind of mental health stuff is kind of something that's not you know wasn't just 2011. So I had periods. I think probably from I probably started to really recognise it in kind of 2007 time, and then yeah, good good periods and not such good periods, and you know the 2010 World Cup. I probably had a really open kind of mindset to my cricket, and it was a bit of a kind of I didn't it, I, well I didn't put in too much pressure on myself because of um, I just you know saw it as an opportunity really, um, and I was in a really good headspace and I'd done a lot of work previously to get myself in a good headspace. Um, so yeah, so I was in, I probably in that period of my life, that kind of probably, yeah, those few months leading into it. And then the world cup, I was in a really good headspace. So yeah, so I was, I was fine then. Are um, international teams in England handling these situations much better now, or, or, or they probably were before, but are they identifying um, players that might have um, some problems? Um, I think I, I I have no complaints in, in how I was kind of treated and dealt with. I thought I was, it was fine. I just got myself in a place where I probably couldn't see too many solutions. And and you know, and I think you know Andy Flower um, and people around at the time were very supportive and very helpful to me. Um, also, I was really very aware that it was you know in the middle of World Cups and things like that. So I certainly didn't want to be a distraction. Um, and yeah, you know, I think I think not just cricket I think cricket's always been you know very good with kind of mental health um but I think society now has changed isn't it in terms of how kind of people see you know mental health uh issues um so I think that hopefully it continues and you know it's not a case it's a case of you know people you know I, I think it's more kind of what's the phrase um yeah I can't I can't think of the words but kind of getting it before it kind of happens and putting things in place rather than kind of looking for kind of solutions after it's happened. So I think, I think, and that's, you know, I think now society is in a better place for that. Yeah. So, so important with all sports, isn't it? Of course. Yeah, of course. Cause I think the one thing I, I always say this, the one thing about playing professional sport is that more than, you know, a lot of jobs or, or what, if something's been your kind of passion and something you've kind of, aspire to do from the age of nine ten there is so much more of your i suppose identity attached to it in terms of how you view yourself you you know because that's what you've had whether you know whether that be sport whether that be music if it's something that you've had a real passion for before you then have to understand that you know sometimes when you, you're more kind of uh, your identity is more attached to it so then and that can and that you know when it's going great that can you know but if, if you're aware of that and you can and people you can help players be aware of that then i think that will be you know really really helpful where you know some people you know wouldn't have done their job their day job now you know when they were they wouldn't have aspired maybe you know when they're 12 or 13 or or been kind of doing things that would help them with their career right now if that makes sense away from kind of sport or or something that's been their passion so there may be less there's less identity you know they they, they identify less with their job than maybe a sports person or or someone has that got that passion well thanks for sharing those thoughts uh, with me mm. what what are you now up to now i know you've been coaching since you retired in 2015 yes so i'm coaching now and um yeah i'm head coach of the england 19s uh and the young lions kind of overall program which again is something i really enjoy it's i get I get an opportunity to work with you know well, there will be future England players and hopefully, you know, very successful future England players. And, you know, I'll play a small part on the start, start of their journey of wearing an England shirt. And, you know, you want to kind of inspire them to to go and, you know, be the next Ben Stokes or the next Joe Root or, you know, or Jimmy Anderson. You want that kind of, you know, and like I say, it kind of when they come into kind of the under-19s, they're 16, 7 or even 15 to 19 you want to kind of make sure that you play a small part in making sure it's a special experience for them so you know so they really do identify with playing for England and the England badge and there's plenty of uh, aspiring England uh, internationals in the pipeline yes yeah for sure I think there's um, yeah that's one thing there's a lot of good young players out there there's a lot of good young players and um, you know around you know who some who are involved in the program some who you know just missed out but you know you don't know when 
some people develop at different stages. So I think it's, it's um, yeah, I think it's really exciting. I think we've got some really good young players around the country and something to kind of look forward to in the future. This year's uh, 2024 World Cup, uh, mm. can England retain the trophy and become the, thir- the first third winners of the uh, T20 World Cup? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah, I think, I, I, yeah. I'm very confident. And again, sometimes it will come to might come to a little moment in a game or a little bit of luck or something like that. But you look at England's team and the way they're set up and the way they're led. I think they'll. I definitely think. I if yeah. I think I think they'll they'll go in. In my mind, they'll go in as favourites and and hopefully bring bring the trophy back. But lots of other teams have got chances. Quite an open tournament. And that's it, isn't it? That's the thing with two twenty. It can come down to those small moments where, you know. A, a catch on the rope that just goes over that someone can't get back or you know or yeah or 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 a nick or something like that you know it can it can come down to those fine margins but I do think England have a lot of kind of what, what's the phrase kind of a lot, a lot of kind of areas covered and you know with high quality players whether that be at the top of the order or you know now you know they've got pace in the bowling got quality spin you know um, hitters in the middle, so they've got. I don't. I don't look at the England team and think, oh, there's some something they're missing. I think they've got a very strong team, and yeah, I'm sure we will be willing them on to win the tournament. Do you like the idea of 20 teams now in the competition? I, I'll be honest, I haven't given it much thought, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll probably just have to pass that one because I haven't given it much thought. But um, I think the one thing I suppose you are finding is that 2020 is that is is a game where. Actually, there's dangerous players, kind of in in all teams wherever you go in the world. So if you if you don't quite get it right, and you're playing against, you know what, you know you can get a couple of players who hit a hot streak and could put you under pressure. So yeah, probably more than any other format, it's yeah, it can come down because it's a shorter time. It can come back down to those little moments and 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 how people deliver them. And winding up, a few final reflections on your famous victory in 2010. I th- I just think it was a it it, it was a really good one. personally it was a really good time in terms of playing for England. I think the environment was excellent in terms of you know what was created and and there was a you know, there was a real belief in 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 going on and you know having a chance. No no one ever said we're going to win it, but I think everyone felt that if we got things right, we were going to have a really good chance. And I think as as I say, if you get role clarity, you've got decent players, and and you build build confidence and you're not going to be far off well thank you very much mike for sharing your what was it like two moment thank you very much Stephen. sports social podcast network jordan b peterson we who wrestle with god tour if you say the truth and nothing else you'll have a immense adventure as a consequence you won't know what's going to happen to you but the truth will reveal the world the way it's intended to be revealed, and the consequence for you will be that you'll have the adventure of your life. Live at DAR Constitution Hall for two nights, June 9th and 10th. Get tickets now at Ticketmaster.com.